Good. Then we start into today's last session, and I'm happy to introduce you to Marcel Vince, who um, did his bachelor's here in tubing, actually, in cognitive science, a master's in Stockholm, I think, and um, yeah, is um, now doing a postdoc here in, at the MPI, uh, where some of you have been uh, of biological cybernetics in the group of Eric Schultz um, on um, yeah, meter reinforcement learning and um, human uh, model or human behavioral modeling, I'd say. And that's what this workshop is about as well. Um, and we will have some interactive session. There's the link there. I'll also share that also in the, in the Telegram group. But without further ado, here's myself. Uh, yeah, thanks, Toby, for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the last session of today. Uh, this is a tutorial on, or with the title, The Art and Science of Modeling Human Decision Making. Uh, most of this tutorial will be um, kind of in a lecture style. But uh, in between, we have these kind of short interludes where you get a chance to like write short code examples of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. All the materials that you uh, need for this, including the slides and uh, the code template, uh, you can find on my webpage, masterwins.github.io. You don't need to download them right now. We can do this just before the first uh, code example. And um, as Toby said, the link is already shared in the Telegram group. Um, so yeah. And uh, so I'm sure some of you will be a bit familiar with uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today already. But I hope that there's something new for everybody at least. So the main goal of this tutorial is um, to kind of teach you a general set of modeling skills that you can take afterwards and go out and apply them to your own research projects. So I try to keep all of the concepts fairly general. That being said, it's often good to see how these things are applied on an example. And this is actually what we do in the first part um, of this tutorial. So we will walk through an example of how you can build models of human decision-making on a multi arm bandit task. And then in the second part, which is a bit shorter than the first one, we will see how these models can be used to learn something about human cognition, to learn how uh, people make decisions in these kind of tasks. And I should say in the beginning, if you have questions at any point, feel free to interrupt me and we can clarify on that. And also the last part is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, flexible on how long it is. So uh, just let me know if I'm running over time or not uh, and we can adjust. So given that you are already all here on a summer school on computational modeling, I guess you all can agree with me that computational models are really useful tools for improving our understanding of human behavior can use them to analyze uh, human decisions and uh, by doing so better understand them. And in this context, I really like this quote here from this paper by Fume, uh, which says that verbally expressed statements can be sometimes flawed by internal inconsistencies, logical contradictions, theoretical weaknesses, and gaps. A running computational model, on the other hand, can be considered as a sufficient proof of the internal coherence and the completeness of the ideas it is based upon. And this kind of highlights what uh, computational models are, what their main purpose is. They are really precise implementations of some vague ideas or hypothesis that we have. And they really force us to be more precise and more clear in our ideas and the things that we want to investigate. One question that comes up a lot, especially by early students, master students, bachelor students, also PhD students, is how do you actually build these computational models? And I think this is maybe not the first question you should ask yourself. Instead, you should ask yourself, why do I want to build a model in the first place? And I think um, James McKellen in his paper that is called The Place of Modeling in Cognitive Science puts this really precisely where he says that Models are tools for exploring the implications of ideas. So with a computational model at hand, you can really investigate ideas that you have and try to test different hypotheses. And typically you start with having an hypothesis and then you want to build a model based on that. 
And this also goes back to the thing that I mentioned from the previous slide, that models are often really these precise implementations of a particular hypothesis that you have. So typically, as I alluded to already, you start with some kind of hypothesis and you then try to uh, formulate this hypothesis more precisely and eventually build a computational model from it. But this whole interaction can also sometimes go in the other direction. Sometimes you have, you know, a model or an algorithm. For example, if you're just taking a class in computer science, you see this kind of model and you think, ah, maybe this is something that a person could do. And in this way, models can also inform what kind of hypothesis we have about how people approach different tasks. So this interaction is really often in both ways. Sometimes hypotheses inform our models, but sometimes it's also the other way around. Now, coming back to the original question, and this is the second question you should ask yourself, how do you actually build these models? And here, building computational models, I think, is often more of an art than an actual science. And this is because there's no single right way of doing it. And I think uh, Hemming, the inventor of Hemming codes, puts this best in this quote here, where he says that, how to be a great painter cannot be taught in words. Instead, one learns by trying many different approaches that seem to surround the subject. And he made the statement in the context of computer science and engineering, and kind of said that you have to try out all these different approaches and then learn your kind of own way um, of doing things. And I think this is also true for models. It's really hard to tell you exactly how to do models, but instead it's often better to show you a bunch of examples on how different kind of modeling approaches can look like. And by learning about a bunch of these examples, you can kind of acquire your own style of how to do it. And this is exactly what we'll do in this tutorial. We, in the first part, which um, is the largest portion of this tutorial, we uh, will see how to build models of human decision-making on a simple multi arm bandit task. So a multi arm bandit task, in this case, we are considering a two arm bandit task, is a task where a decision-maker is exposed to two different slot machines, slot machine one and slot machine two. In each trial, the decision-maker can decide to select one of these slot machines and in turn gets feedback in form of some kind of reward. So in this case, the decision maker selected slot machine one and lost 41 cents, for example. And then this whole interaction repeats for a number of time steps. So in the second trial, the decision maker maybe selects the other option. And in this case, this option yielded a reward of 40 cents. Next trial, maybe you select option one again and you lose 48 cents again. And then this whole interaction repeats for a bunch of interactions. And typically, a goal that we give to a decision maker in this task is to accumulate as much rewards as you can over these over a certain number of tries. Now, what a decision maker do, does not know is that underlying these two slot machines are two probability distribution that decide how likely is it that a certain reward is generated if you select one of these slot machines. If you choose to play it, you get reward according to some probability distribution. And these dis probability distribution to distributions are characterized by some set of parameters, which I'll call mu in this presentation. Now, multi-armed bandit problems are a really interesting testbed for human cognition because finding an optimal solution to these kind of tasks is very hard. So hard that provoked this following quote here that I've taken from Wikipedia, which says that it, or, or the multi bandit problem, was originally considered by allied scientists in World War II, but it proved to be so intractable that, according to Peter Whittle, the problem was proposed to be dropped over Germany so that the German scientists could waste their time on it. <laughs> on the other hand, there are a lot of research papers that even the single simplest organisms on our planet, single cell organisms, can solve multi armed bandit problems with a reasonable level of performance. So you kind of have this uh, conflict here. On the one hand, even simple organisms are able to make reasonably good decision in these kind of problems. But on the other hand, solving it optimally is really, really hard. And this I feel makes it really interesting as a test bed for um, testing out ideas on human decision-making because presumably humans are somewhere in the middle here. They are hopefully a bit smarter than single cell organisms, but they likely cannot solve this problem optimally because doing so would involve crazily complex uh, computations. 
And this gives us a really broad spectrum of different hypotheses to work with and to consider that people could potentially apply. But typically in these kind of tasks, I said, um, or I said in the beginning, or two slides back, that each of these two choices, each of these two slot machines, is associated with a probability distribution that generates these rewards. And these parameters mu are the parameters that control how these um, uh, control how these distributions look like. Now, if the decision maker knows these parameters, the task is essentially trivial. You simply compute the expected value of both of these distributions for our two unbanded problem, and simply decide to pick the option with the highest expected value. And then by that, you gain as much rewards on average as you can. Now, typically, we instead consider the case where these uh, underlying parameters mu are not observed directly, which makes the task much more challenging. And then the goal from the perspective of the decision maker is to infer these parameters, because if the decision maker would know them, it could make optimal decisions again. So now when we want to build a computational model for these kind of tasks, we have to consider two subproblems. The first subproblem is a problem of learning, where you see certain observations and you update your beliefs how, how likely it is that a certain slot machine gives you reward or not. And this is the learning problem. And in the second step, you have to decide how you make decisions. How do you use the knowledge that you currently have about these two slot machines to decide which of them you pick? And this is a decision-making problem. In this tutorial here, for reasons of simplicity, we assume that our models learn in a rational way, so that they incorporate these observations that they make about how rewarding these two arms are optimally. Now, of course, there's a pretty big assumption that ideally you should uh, test and practice, but as I said here, we assume that it's true because it makes our job of modeling a bit easier. And we are then only concerned in modeling the decision-making process. So given that humans have these optimal uh, beliefs on how rewarding these two slot machines are, how do they decide which of them to pick? And this is what we are going to model. That being said, I want to briefly explain um, the learning component as well, where I said that uh, we assume that our agents learn optimally about the observation that it sees. And in a world where we have some uncertain information, in this case, we don't know the parameters of these, under, of these underlying distributions, optimal learning algorithms are given by this idea of Bayesian inference. The general principle behind Bayesian inference is that you have some kind of prior beliefs on how these parameters look like. And this is captured by a prior, prior distribution over these parameters. <clears throat> and then the second component that you have is a likelihood which is this distribution here over rewards, given that you take, take a certain action, and given that you know that a certain uh, parameter value is actually true. And this tells you how likely do you think is, is it that a certain reward is generated, given that you would know these true parameter estimates. And then in Bayesian inference, after you have, obs uh, have observed a new data point, and in our case, a new data point is which action you have taken and which reward uh, you have received subsequently, um, you want to update your beliefs. So you want to update your prior beliefs over these parameter values into a posterior distribution. And to do so by taking the prior, multiplying with it with a likelihood, and then uh, dividing it by some kind of normalization concept. Now Bayesian inference gives you an optimal uh, strategy if the prior and the likelihood actually match how data is generated in the environment. So if the prior that the agent has and the likelihood that it assumes match how the world generates the data, then only then Bayesian inference is an optimal strategy. And there are many justifications for this, such as dutch bulk arguments, free energy minimization, or performance-based measures. We won't cover this in detail today, but if you're interested in this, there's a link on the slide where you can see um, one such uh, proof that shows you that Bayesian inference is an optimal learning strategy according to some measurement. Now, the tricky thing with Bayesian inference is that it's often hard to find an analytical expression for the posterior distribution. And indeed, often it's uh, straight, uh, straight up imposs impossible. It only works if you assume a certain combination of prior and likelihood. And the example that we walk through in this tutorial, we assume that the prior over these unobserved parameters follows a normal distribution with some mean m and some standard deviation s, 
And we furthermore assume a likelihood, which is also a normal distribution with um, centered around uh, the mean mu and with some noise term sigma. And we additionally assume that this uh, noise variance, sigma squared, is also known to the agent. Now, with these uh, two assumptions at hand, uh, we can actually find an analytical expression for the Bayesian updating equations. And in this case, the posterior distribution will also be a normal distribution, where the parameters of this normal distribution are updated as follows. If uh, you don't observe, uh, if the data point, or you don't observe your beliefs about actions that were not taken. So if you have not taken an action, you don't update your beliefs because you have no new information. For all the other actions or for the action that you have taken, you update the posterior mean by taking the prior mean and add some term to it that is given by the learning rate times the difference of the actually observed reward and your prior mean. And in this case, the learning rate uh, is not a fixed constant, but it's determined by the noise variance and the variance of your prior. Oh. Variance of your prior. Uh, and this uh, updating of the mean kind of over time um, converges to the true mean. And then you also update your uh, posterior variance. And you do so by taking your prior variance and subtract the term to it that is given by the learning rate times the prior variance. So essentially, this means over time, you become more and more certain for the actions that you have taken. And eventually, after you have taken the, uh, seen enough observation of this particular action, you're quite certain on how rewarding it is. We won't cover the deviation of this today, but if you want to learn more on this slide, there's also a link to a video by a YouTuber called Mathematical Monk who has really great videos on all kind of Bayesian machine learning topics. And in this video, he goes to on how you can derive these updating equations. But for now, we actually want to implement this idea of Bayesian inference for our two amp bandit problem in a simple code example. So how we do this, I think I will briefly explain um, there's like a part of the code given already. And I briefly walk you through what is already there and what you should implement. And in the meanwhile, you can download uh, the corresponding iPad notebook. And uh, then you have some time afterwards to uh, do the actual coding. And as I said before, you can find the uh, corresponding iPad notebook on my webpage, uh, masterbins.github.io. OK, so let's briefly take a look at the code that is already given. So here in this first cell, we import a bunch of libraries. I think for this, we need nothing special. We just need this uh, internal Python library called mass. We need a NumPy library. We use a bit of SciPy and a matplotlib just for plotting. So all fairly standard libraries. And then we define one class, which we call uh, two-armed Gaussian, uh, two Gaussian bandit, which is essentially our environment. So this is an implementation of this two-armed bandit problem. This uh, class takes two arguments, the variance of the mean and the variance of the actually observed rewards. And then when this class is instantiated, um, you sample the mean of the actual rewards from your prior distribution. In our case, this prior distribution has a mean of zero and the mean variance is given by this parameter here. So for each of the actions, we sample a true mean. And then this class has this function called sample reward, which takes one parameter, uh, the action that is taken. And then based on the action taken by the agent, it generates a reward. And this reward is also sampled from a normal distribution with the mean that we have sampled before from the prior and a variance that is given by this reward variance uh, parameter. Then the second thing that we have, let's see. So, okay, perfect. So here you have the equations again, copied from the slides pretty much. And then we have this class called Bayesian learner. This essentially implements this idea of Bayesian inference for our two-armed Gaussian bandit problem. This uh, class takes a number of arguments. It takes the mean variance and the reward variance. And these are the same parameters that we give to um, our uh, bandit problem. 
And then it takes as an additional argument a number of actions. In our case, this will be two. And then when this class is instantiated, we uh, initialize the prior mean of the agent and its prior variance, and we give it uh, access to this reward variance. And then it has this update function, it takes uh, two arguments, an action and a reward. So the action that was actually taken by the agent and the corresponding reward that was observed. And then here you have to compute this learning rate, um, compute the update the prior mean for the taken action and update the prior variance. And this is essentially the job, uh, your job in the first uh, coding exercise. Then there's some short loop to test these things where we first initialize our environment, this two arm bandit problem. Then we initialize our learner. So this, uh, the agent pretty much. Then we artificially set the mean rewards of our bandit to two and four. So which means that the first arm will have a mean reward of two and the second arm will have a mean reward of four. And this is kind of to ensure that we all get the same plots. And then there's a loop where we loop over 200 time steps. So in this case, our agent sees 200 observations. In each time step, we store the agent's current prior mean into a, a matrix just to keep track of uh, how the mean changes over time. Then we randomly select an action. So in this case, our agent randomly sees an observation either from the first bandit or the second from the first arm or the second arm. Then we sample a reward from our underlying reward distribution. And then we call this update function where the agent updates its belief. And this is the thing that you are supposed to implement here. And finally, we plot these results. And in the end, hopefully, you should get a plot that looks something like this. Uh, questions about this? Yeah. Um, A is where? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me see. I have a hard time because I can't use the mouse here. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Ah, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so you mean in this cell, right? Yeah, so A is a particular action. So essentially, um, good questions. Let's see, scroll again. So essentially what you want to do, if you have an uh, if you have a data point where you have observed one action and a corresponding reward, and then you want to update your beliefs and you have a uh, belief over each of these actions, how rewarding they are. And A here is uh, index that index which of these actions you want to update. If um, for actions that are not observed, you don't want to update because you don't get any new information. And for all the other, uh, for the other action, the one that you have seen, you want to update. Yep. So A is indexed by T, which is what happens to the right? Yes. And so in the first iteration, basically, what is the initial A that you have? Ah, okay. So pretty much if I can also explain it on the code, I think. So in this case, A is simply what you pass here through to the agent. The random, in this case, we randomly select which action uh, the agent has taken. And in this, in the code example, it would be this action variable. Yeah, so maybe let's do like, uh, I think three to four minutes and then, uh, we can see the results. Did everyone, everyone download the, the code? Oh, damit du vielleicht nicht. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, so in the code, the uh, RT is essentially called reward. Yeah. So in essence, in the code, you have these two um, arguments that you pass to the update function, action and reward. And in the equations, action is this A variable and reward is the R variable. Yeah, so in this uh, code example, S corresponds to I mean, the meaning. Ah, the meaning. Mm -hmm. If you look at the uh, other equations, um, so S is the variant of um, your prior belief. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you have here, so you have um, your prior is a normal distribution in this case. And what do you mean by prior? And you mean I choose this bandit or this? Uh, no, it kind of captures your um, belief on how like you think ah, a certain so, reward is going so to happen. So it's like this bandit give me 50% reward, 50%. For, for example, right? And uh, this is expressed with a normal distribution. And this normal distribution, so, so it's, uh, it's in cents or in total? Um, in sense, so you kind of it in can market. take any continuous value, mm -hmm. and you express your belief that any of these values can happen with mm -hmm. Gaussian distribution. I press this button, I will get five dollars. Five dollars, maybe I get four dollars, maybe a four fifty, yeah. and so on. And um, what is A? A, which A? A, A. Uh, so that's an alpha. That's uh, just a, uh, mm -hmm. a thing that we define here. Mm -hmm. And this A is the action that you have taken. Ah, oh, it's different terms. Yeah, this is the A. Uh, I see. Uh, so it, once again, this is the prior. This is an action, right? Mm, no, it, um, so you have this prior. Mm -hmm. um, the prior is a Gaussian distribution with some mean and some standard deviation. Mm -hmm. um, when you take these two values or the standard deviation, you can compute this whole term here if, mm. if you have additional access to the sigma. Um, and then you update these uh, two things by these two equations. And these then they describe your belief after this, making this observation. Yeah, but, but, uh, but how they are connected? So I, I so this found alpha out happens ANS. in here and here. So mm -hmm. that's how they're connected. Mm -hmm. as you see yeah, it's current application. I think we have to go on, but yeah, uh, yeah, there is also a solution. Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe we stop at this point. Ideally, the graph that you have gotten looks something like this where on the x-axis, you uh, we have plotted time, and on the y-axis, we have plotted uh, the reward, where the dotted line shows the true underlying reward of both of these options. Uh, arm one had an underlying reward of two, arm two had an underlying reward of four. And the solid line shows the uh, prior belief of our agent at a given time step. And what we see here over time, that the agent's belief 
converge to the actual true value, which is what we want of a, uh, an optimal agent. Uh, maybe a quick question. How many of you were able to uh, reproduce something that looks like this? Maybe short hands, hands up. Okay, just a few. No, that's not a big problem. Uh, the solution is actually if you go in this uh, uh, IPython notebook, if you go down a few cells, uh, you find a solution where everything is implemented. So, and we can use this later on for the follow up exercises. And I think the next two or three exercises will be a bit simpler. So, um, any questions so far? Yeah. Should we look this through? Because for me, it's the start is quite. Yeah, so um, depending on what you plot, I think it should. The side can always look different for different runs, right? But ideally, after you have made enough observation, it should converge to the actual right? Whether it's exactly the same. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, as in essence, if we go back on this slide, you can interpret alpha as some kind of learning rate. Um, but it's not a free parameter in this model. But instead, it is given by your prior variance. This is this S or S squared. And it is given of the noise variance of your um, uh, reward distribution. So if you have, uh, if you observe very noisy observations where the noise sigma is very high, you will learn slower because then you have to integrate over a lot of noisy observations, which is harder, takes longer. If this is very close to zero, you can learn quite quickly. And that's how um, you can see, view this as a kind of learning rate. More questions? All right, then let's go on. So up to now, we have, oh, there was one more, yeah. Um, I can show it, yes. Give me a second. So if you go to the notebook and go down, I think one cell or two cells. Ah, yeah, you find a solution here in cell number five, it should be. So you have to implement these updating equations. First, you have to uh, compute this alpha, where you take the prior variance of this action that you have seen and divide it by the sum of the prior variance of the action and the reward variance. Um, and then you have to update the prior mean. Uh, you take the old prior mean of this action and add this term to it where you have the learning rate times the difference between the actually observed reward and uh, your initial prior. And then you also have to update the prior variance of the action that you have seen, which where you take the old prior variance and subtract this term to, from it, where you have the learning rate times the old prior variance. All right. Okay, so we have seen how we can learn optimally about how these distributions over rewards of the two options look like. But what we really want to get in this tutorial is how do we actually make, how do people make decisions based on the beliefs that they currently have? So how can we get at a model like this? And here's one general recipe on how you can do that. First, you come up with some kind of hypothesis and there can be many different ways on where these kind of hypotheses come from. Then you take this hypothesis and turn it into a precise computational model. And then once you have done that, you can explore what kind of implications um, your hypothesis has and what kind of things about what kind of things you have to be more precise. One very obvious hypothesis that we could have in this kind of task is that people always pick the action that they think has the highest expected value. So how can we do this? Essentially, we loop over all the actions. For each action, we take our posterior uh, beliefs, compute its expected value, and then pick the action with the highest expected value. And in this case, our posterior beliefs are given by a Gaussian distribution with some mean, m, and some uh, standard deviation. And for a Gaussian distribution, the expected value is just a mean. So essentially, all we have to do is we have to check for all the actions, what is the mean, our current mean belief of uh, these rewards, and then pick the action with the highest one. 
And this kind of strategy is also called exploitation because it exploits the knowledge that the agent currently has. And then now we have the next coding exercise. So let me briefly go into it and explain what is given. Yeah, so essentially what you have to do is you have to implement this uh, exploitation-based strategy. You uh, are provided with an implementation of this of the Bayesian updating equations that we have seen before. So here you have how uh, this uh, class should have looked like. And then we create an additional class which um, inherits from this Bayesian learner class. So it gets all the function from its parent but it additionally implements this act function. And in this act function, the agent should pick the action according to this exploitation rule. And here your job is to implement this function and you should return uh, a single integer value which corresponds to the selected action. So in this case, um, Python uh, uses zero indexing. So you should return a zero if you want to pick slot machine one and you should return a one if you pick slot machine two. And then to test uh, this um, model, we need some kind of function. So first we initialize our uh, to unbended problem again. We initialize our agent. Again, like before, we set the mean of the reward distributions to two and four, just to ensure that we get the same plots. And then we loop over a number of time steps again, store the uh, prior mean that the agent currently has in this um, NumPy array. And here's the only thing that pretty much changed here. Now, instead of selecting these actions randomly, we let the agent select it, uh, the action itself. So, and we do this by calling this agent.x function. And then we sample a reward based on the action that was taken from our bandit problem. And we update the agent's beliefs using the taken action and the observed reward. And then once you are done, you should get a plot that looks something similar to this. And I think we do like another five minutes um, and then see how, how this went. Uh, yeah. So, I'm supposed to pick only one. 
So maybe let's stop at this point anyway. So ideally the plot uh, that you have produced when you implemented this looks something like this, where we clearly see that in the beginning, the agent picks the action number one, observes some positive reward, updates the belief so that it's slightly higher than zero, and then it keeps on picking this first action because in this case, the mean of the first action is always higher than the initial mean of the second action, which was zero. So over time, it has only picked uh, pick one action and did not try out the other, even though the mean reward of the other action would have been even higher, would have been four instead of two if, and the agent, but the agent failed to figure this out. Uh, how many of you were able to reproduce a plot that looked like this? Okay, I think that was, those were the most. Sometimes uh, you pick the other Yeah, that can happen as well, yeah. I, you don't get this plot always, uh, if, but if you run it two or three times, I think typically at some point uh, you should get it. Yeah, and this can happen sometimes. It picks the other action because when it takes the uh, uh, first action, and then you actually observe a reward that is smaller than zero, then it will pick the second action. And this can happen with a mean of two with our parameters, but it's fairly unlikely. Okay. Um, we won't go over the solutions in detail here, but I will upload the uh, full solutions later as a notebook so you can double check that. Um, so what we have seen in this plot is that the best, best action was actually never selected by our agent and likely it will never be selected, no matter how many tries we give it. And this kind of illustrates that pure exploitation strategies can ignore the long-term benefits of acquiring new knowledge. And in our case, this is an example of what is sometimes called the exploration exploitation dilemma, which tells us that we cannot always exploit the knowledge that we currently have, but we sometimes have to go out and gather new information. So sometimes we have to try, try out an action, which we do not know much about in order to uh, gain better long-term benefits. And then the question becomes, how can we build an agent that has this kind of capacity for exploring. And to do so, it's useful to take a look at what, what kind of ideas prior work has suggested. And two ideas that are quite uh, prevalent in the literature are this idea of random exploration, which essentially tells you that you should inject some form of noise, some form of stochasticity into your decision-making process. And the second idea is this idea of directed exploration. Directed exploration essentially says that you should provide some bonus reward to the agent so that this bonus reward encourages the agent to visit parts of the problem space 
that it has not seen before. So you should somehow encourage it to try out new things and tell it that it is uh, rewarding to do so. Now, these two things, these two uh, definitions are two awake expressions of a potential um, theory of how people might explore. And there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between these two definitions and different computational models. Indeed, it's the case that both of these two ideas have many different potential implementations, both for random and for directed exploration. But what we'll do next is we take a look at some examples on how these two ideas might be implemented. So we come up with a second hypothesis on how people could make decisions to solve this exploration exploitation uh, dilemma. And the hypothesis that we want to consider here is that people add some kind of noise into their decision-making process. And this was the idea of random exploration. One way to implement this is um, by using a strategy that is sometimes called Boltzmann exploration. In Boltzmann exploration, you don't decide on a particular action in a deterministic way, but instead you define a probability that you select a particular action. In this case, you define a probability that you select action one, and then the probability of selecting action two follows from that. And in Boltzmann exploration, this probability is proportional to E raised to the power of W times the pri your prior mean of uh, the first action. And then you divide this whole thing by a normalization constant to ensure that it's a probability distribution. And this kind of function is also sometimes called a softmax function. And intuitively in this function, the higher your expected reward is, the more likely you will be to, pit, uh, to pick a particular action. And the degree of how noisy this decision-making process is, is controlled, controlled by this parameter W, which is sometimes called an inverse temperature parameter. In our case, when we only have uh, two potential choices, we can rewrite this expression a bit. We can write the probability of selecting action one by the softmax function, and then we will write out the sum in the denominator. And then we uh, divide each of these two terms, or each of these terms, by um, the thing that we have in our nominator, by this term here. And if we do this, the nominator becomes one, the first term in this denominator becomes one, and the second term here will essentially be this second term, our original term, divided by this term here, which um, we can write as e raised to the power of w times the difference between m2 and m1. And then what we do is we um, factor out a factor of minus one out of this um, out of these brackets here, and we get the following expression: one divided by one plus e raised to the power of minus w times the difference between m1 and m2. And this kind of function is also known as a sigmoid function that we have here. And so this kind of free formulation told us that the probability of selecting a particular action in a Boltzmann exploration strategy is given by a sigmoid function of the scale difference between rewards. Let's briefly look how this, uh, how this can look like. So what we have here is on the x-axis, we have plotted the mean difference between M1 and M2. And on the y-axis, we have plotted the probability of selecting action one. So if we are on the right half of this plot here, um, arm one has a much higher mean reward than arm two. And in this case, we are very likely so to select arm one. If we are somewhere in the middle, um, M1 and M2 are roughly um, equally large. And then we are pretty much indifferent which of these actions we choose. And then if you're on the uh, left half here, the mean of the second option is much larger than the mean of the first option. And we are very unlikely therefore to pick option one and will predominantly pick action two. Um, and now we take this uh, idea of Boltzmann exploration and we'll implement it in, in code. So let's see briefly what we have. So your job in this exercise is to implement this idea of Boltzmann exploration. Uh, here you have the updating equations again. And similar to before, you have to implement um, um, an act function in an agent. In this case, we have an agent called Boltzmann exploration, which again inherits from this Bayesian learner class. 
and you have to implement this act function where you return an integer which action you select. Yeah. Um, so this uh, the exploration function is because there are only one such two actions, right? Yeah, in our but case. So pretty then probably we should make it throw an error and initialize it with some actions something. Yeah, you could you could you could definitely do that. That would have been way nicer to do it, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, nobody's stopping you from implementing this with the softmax function as well, so that it can work for more. Uh, yeah, but uh, you're correct. And also, there's like this additional helper function that you can use where I've defined the sigmoid function for you. Um, and then the testing code is essentially exactly the same that we have seen before. So maybe let's do another five minutes and then see the results. And hopefully, at the end, you produce a plot that looks something like this one here. Um, it depends a bit on what we actually see. So I just want to add to the line. 
and it's because they had a lot of friendliness and how they were more friendly and how they actually sent that. Over. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, let's stop this here and uh, let me first ask on how many of you were able to reproduce a plot that looked something like this. I mean, there's a lot of noise in here, so it does not have to look exactly the same, uh, but something like this. Okay. Um, maybe given that not uh, like roughly half of you have done so, maybe let me briefly uh, sketch the solution on how it could look like. Um, and then I'll upload the full solution later um, uh, after the tutorial is finished. So roughly how this should look like if we implement this here is that you first compute some kind of probability that's called as P of selecting uh, action zero. And in this case, this is given by some kind of sigmoid function that we have defined up here um, of our parameter. I think this is self dot W. And then we multiply this with the difference in mean, mean zero uh, minus mean one. So this is not function code, but this is roughly how it should look like. And then you return basically a sample from a distribution that is defined by these probabilities. And one way to do this is by calling this numpy, I think, dot random dot choice function. There you can define the different options as a first argument, I believe. So in this case, the different options. Oh, oh. At nine, how do I get back, Toby? <laughs> I should bring it back. Ah, yeah. Okay, but anyway, you you pass like all the different options as the first argument. So in this case, this might be zero and one, and then as the second argument, you pass these probabilities. So in this case, you have probabilities p and one uh, minus p, something like this. Um, and I said I'll update the full, uh, I upload the full solutions later on. So, and then what you see in this plot here essentially is that initially in this example, action selected action two, learned that action two has a very high reward. And then in the beginning, it stuck to picking action two. But then after a while, after roughly 10 trials, it randomly selected option one and learned that the reward for option one is roughly two. And then it continued predominantly sampling action one because it had a higher reward. But sometimes every now and then, and this is when you see a spike here, it selected action one as well. And by this kind of process of sometimes randomly selecting action one, it implemented this idea of random exploration. Questions about this? Cool, then let's talk, take a look at two other alternative models. So far we have implemented this idea of random exploration. So let's now implement this idea of directed exploration. So here our hypothesis is that people tend to select arms for which they can gather more information. And this is the idea behind directed exploration. How do we implement this in our case? In our setting, we can use our uncertainties in our posterior distribution to guide exploration. So instead of only selecting the action with the highest uh, posterior mean, as we have done in the exploitation strategy, we can define the value of an action as the posterior mean plus a term that depends on a parameter w times the standard deviation of uh, the posterior. So here, the first term ensures that the agent sometimes exploits. It picks the action that it thinks is good. And the second term ensures that sometimes it will pick actions that have very high uncertainty. Um, and the idea is kind of the actions where you have very high uncertainty are actions where, for which you can learn a lot about when you sample them thereby by reducing your uncertainty when you see new observations. 
And the straight off between exploration and exploitation here is controlled by this parameter W, um, which trades off the mean against the standard deviation and how valuable these actions are. And this kind of strategy is part of a broader family of strategies, which are sometimes called upper, upper confidence bound or UCB algorithms. Maybe to illustrate brief, this briefly, let's assume we have a posterior belief over our two options that look as follows. We have the first option, the blue one here, which is a Gaussian that is centered around zero and is quite, quite wide. In this case, it I think it has a standard deviation of one. The second option has a, a mean value that is slightly larger than the one of the first one, and it is also narrow. So according to an exploitation strategy or equivalently an upper confidence bound uh, strategy, where we set our trade-off parameter W to zero, we would assign a value of zero to the first, uh, to the blue strategy, uh, to the blue action. And we would say assign a value of 0 0.5 to the second action. So these are simply their means. And then an exploitation-based strategy would pick the orange action because it has a higher mean than the blue one. In contrast to this, if we have an upper confidence bound strategy, which uses a parameter for the straight off of W equal to one, we uh, get the following situations, situation. For the blue action, which had a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, the value will be one. Whereas for the orange strategy, which had a mean of 0 0.5 and a standard deviation of, I think, uh, 0 0.25, we get a value of 0 0.75. So in this case, an agent that applies an upper confident bound strategy with this parameter equal to one should select the blue action instead of the orange one. And thereby exploring by trying to select the actions for which is more uncertain about, which has a, a broader, uh, broader prior. So let's briefly take a look at um, the fourth and last hypothesis. And the hypothesis that we want to look at here is the idea that people tend to say sample actions relative to the proportion of a particular action being correct. So if you think, for example, that the probability that action one is better than action two is 80%, then if you apply such a strategy, you should pick action one in 80% of the time. And thereby you kind of also have this noise in there because sometimes you will pick actions that you think is worse. And this idea goes under many names. Uh, in this tutorial, we use the name Thompson sampling, but sometimes it's also called posterior sampling or probability matching, and there are many other names. And as I said before, this is an example of random exploration because it has some noise to our decision-making process. There are two different, or at least two different ways of how you can implement this idea. If we go to two of such implementations. In the first implementation, we draw a sample from our current posterior beliefs. So we have a posterior distribution over each of these arms and draw a sample for each of them. And then we look at these sampled values and select the action that has the highest sampled value. And here we can clearly see that this noise in this decision-making process comes by sampling from our posterior. Let's uh, see how this roughly looks like. Let's assume again, we have the same distributions as we had before for a blue arm and an orange arm. In this case, I've drawn a bunch of samples from the blue arm, which are marked as um, X's here, and a bunch of samples from the orange arm, which are marked as uh, orange X's here. And we can clearly see that a lot of times these orange X's, these sampled values from the orange distribution are larger than the ones from the blue distribution. So that means more often than not, the agent in this case will select the orange action. But sometimes it can happen because our blue distribution is so broad that some of its values that you sample are much larger than any value that can plausibly be sampled from the orange distribution. And if that happens by chance, we will um, pick the blue distribution instead. There's also a second um, kind of implementation on how you can implement this idea of Thompson sampling. And this works as follows. You first compute the probability that action one is better than action two. In our case, this corresponds to the probability that mu one is larger than mu two, that action one has a larger mean than action two. 
And then when you have computed this probability, you will simply draw a sample from the resulting probability distribution. And this clearly ensures also that you sample actions relative to their proportion of being optimal, simply because you first compute the probability that action one is optimal, and then you draw a sample from the resulting probability distribution. Now, in our case, this uh, probability that action one is better than action two actually has a closed form expression with our assumptions of normal distribution uh, when everything is normally distributed. So here in this Thompson sampling based strategy, we uh, define the probability of selecting action number one as the probability that action number one is better than action number two. And this is just a definition of Thompson sampling. Then we subtract, subtract uh, mu two from both of these sides. And uh, we get the probability that the difference between mu one and mu two is larger than zero. And in our case, mu one and mu two are both random, uh, normally distributed random variables. So the difference of these two independently independent random variables is also normally distributed. So we have to find out the probability that a normally distributed random variable is larger than zero. And this can be expressed through what is known as the commutative distribution function of a standard normal distribution of the difference between the means of both of these options scaled by a term that depends on the standard deviation. So let's maybe get an intuition of how this looks like. What is plotted here is this uh, commutative distribution function of a standard normal distribution. And on the x-axis, we have the argument of this function, so the difference in means scaled by this term that depends on your uncertainties. And on the y-axis, we have again the probability of selecting action one. And we clearly see here that uh, this uh, commutative distribution function of the standard normal distribution also takes an S-shape, similar to what we have seen before um, when we had the sigmoid function. So if your means are very different, if mean one, if the mean of arm one is much higher than the mean of arm two, then you will likely select arm one. And if the other way around, you will likely to select arm two. And somewhere in the middle, when they are roughly the same, you are indifferent. So this whole idea of Thompson sampling is actually quite similar to the idea of Boltzmann exploration that we have seen before. But there are two main differences. First, this first the sigmoid function is replaced by the commutative distribution function of a standard normal distribution, which we labeled as phi here. And then additionally, it does not only depend on the differences between rewards, but it is also scaled by what is sometimes called the total uncertainty. So how uncertain we are about these options. If you are very certain on how these rewards look like, Thompson sampling will be basically a deterministic strategy. But if you are very uncertain, it will be a very noisy strategy. And this is controlled by this uh, scaling factor in the denominator here. So both of these implementations that I've talked about, the first implementation where we sampled from our current beliefs and then selected uh, the action with the highest sampled value, which was implementation one, and implementation two, where we computed this probability that action one is better than action two, and then sampled from these probabilities. Both of these ideas have their own uh, merit. Ex implementation one gives you a kind of very general recipe that you can apply basically in every case. You don't need to find an expression for this probability that action one is better than action two, but you only need to sample from your um, beliefs and then look which of these sampled values is the largest. Implementation two is useful because it provides us with a closed form expression of this probability that action one is better than action two. And this is often useful for many follow-up analysis. And we will see an example in the second part uh, today if we get to it. So what we do now is we have another coding exercise. In this coding exercise, you will implement both uh, this upper confidence bound strategy and uh, Thompson sampling. So maybe let's take a brief look at the code again, see how it looks like. Yeah, so here you have to implement both of these strategies. Again, you're provided with these two classes, a Thompson sampling class and an upper confidence bound class. And you have to implement 
uh, again, this act function, which returns a single integer with the corresponding action that is selected according to the respective strategy. And then what we do is we have a slightly different setup. We take a look at all our agents that we have defined so far, the exploitation agent, Boltzmann exploration, and these two new strategies. And we want to measure their performance across many different runs. So in this case, we run a uh, uh, thousand different simulations. Each simulation is run for 100 time steps. And we measure the performance in this uh, regret variable here, which is a NumPy array, where the first dimension corresponds to the agent, the second dimension corresponds to the run, and the, sec uh, the last dimension corresponds to the time step. And then we loop over all these agents and over all possible runs. In each of these runs, we initialize our bandit task randomly. So we, here we do not have the task with where we had the mean reward of two and four, but we have a randomly generated bandit problem. We define our agent, and then we loop over all the time steps, take an action according to the particular strategy, sample a reward, update the agent's beliefs, and then we store our performance. And in this case, we measure performance in terms of the regret which is defined as the difference between the best action that you could have taken, so the one with the highest reward, and the reward of the action that you actually have taken. And by defining it like this, you kind of ensure that if you select the best action all the time, you have a regret of zero. So lower regret means that you perform better. And then we plot these results. And in the end, your plot should look something, something like this here. So maybe do another five, maybe let's do a bit longer, let's do another seven minutes and then compare, we'll see what you got. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay, maybe uh, let's continue. Uh, so ideally, the plot that you have produced looks something like this here, where on the x-axis we have plotted the trial, so which uh, trial the agent was in, and on the y-axis we have plotted the regret. And the different colors correspond to the different strategies that we had, exploitation, Boltzmann exploration, Thompson sampling, and upper confidence bound strategy. What we see here is that uh, the exploitation strategy performed the worst out of these, Followed by this idea of Thompson's, uh, followed by this idea of Boltzmann exploration, which was slightly better, especially in the long run. So definitely, there was some form of benefit of exploring, um, taking explorative actions as well. And then we have Thompson sampling and upper confidence bound strategies, the two that we've just implemented, and these performed the best and nearly re reached a regret of zero after, let's say, here maybe twenty-five tries or so. Uh, who was able to produce a plot that looked something like this? Okay, who was able to get the result for a uh, Thompson sampling with the line like this? I guess this has to be exactly the same amount at least <laughs> than before. Um, or maybe let's ask it differently. Do you want me to explain how any of these two new strategies is implemented, Thompson sampling or upper confidence bounds? Uh, who wants to have upper confidence bond strategy explained? Okay, for Philip, we do it. <laughs> so essentially, what you have to do in, and I again only sketch this here, um, for this upper confidence bond strategy, you had that you select the action with the highest mean plus a weighted standard deviation. So maybe you first compute these values here. Let's call them values. Uh, <laughs> where's the tie? Yeah, yeah. So let's call them values, and we say this is simply the mean. Or well, I think this is self dot prior mean to be exact. Prior mean uh, plus plus. Uh, our parameter times uh, the prior variance. So I think this is prior var variance. And then we'd simply have to take the maximum over the, these values. So something like numpy dot argmax of uh, of these uh, values. <laughs> Sorry, get to see some iRobot uh, of these values. Uh, questions about this? Um, yeah. Sorry? Did you, did you know the square? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, you should include the square. Was good, good point, yeah. Yeah. You won't make it yeah. Well, I guess it can, right? So um, 
for example, uh, because it can can change the difference. Let's say, for example, you have a, this example that we had before, and then you take the square root, I think it comes out something different. So it can happen that it changes the strategy. And then for um, Thompson sampling, we basically have to sample values from our uh, current beliefs. So call these uh, sampled values. And for this, we sample from a normal distribution, something like this. Normal, where the mean is given by our prior mean. Uh, prior, prior mean. And uh, the standard deviation is given by the square root of, no, let's not make the same mistake again, uh, of the prior variance. And then we simply pick the maximum of the sampled values. In this case, so argmax of sampled values. Questions about this? Yeah. That's the first of these implementations, yes. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is equivalent, yes, but you could have also implemented this, and this would have been implemented similar to how you implemented this idea of Boltzmann exploration, right? You compute this probability, and then you sample from the distribution that is defined by these probabilities. Yeah, but uh, so when you generate data from both of these things, they lead to exactly identical um, behavior. And then you pick the highest. And you, if you repeat this process often enough, you sample in proportion to that the action um, of the, that in particular action is uh, optimal. So in this case, if you repeat this whole process and action one is 80% higher, has a 80% chance of being higher than action two, if you do this process, you will actually exactly reach this 80% for action one and 20% for action two. So, and if you do this implementation here, you define these probabilities directly and then sample from a distribution that is defined by these probabilities. So in both cases, you get sampling from uh, the probability of being optimal. Yes. In the example. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. But we can talk about this later again. Maybe we can provide a clearer explanation. Uh, any questions about the stuff that we have seen so far about any of these uh, models that we talked about? Um, yes and no, depending on which uh, strategy you are talking about, right? So for example, this way of implementing Thompson sampling with computing the probability that action one is better than action two, that is very hard to do for many different options. But the other implementation where you sample from your uh, current beliefs and then loop over all these sampled values and select the highest, that definitely works with more uh, options. Yeah. And I think all the other strategies should work as well with more than, uh, more than one, uh, more than two actions. Okay, maybe to, oh, we are, oh, we are we on time? Okay, I think maybe we wrap this up with the first part. So we have discussed different strategies as potential candidate ideas on how people deal with this exploration exploitation dilemma. We had this idea of exploitation, where you simply pick the action that you, is the best according to your current beliefs. We had this idea of Boltzmann exploration, where um, you add some form of randomness to your decision-making process. Then we had this idea of upper confidence bound, where you define the value of an action by the mean plus a term that is the, uh, corresponds to the weighted uh, standard deviation of an action. And then we had this idea of Thompson sampling, where the probability of selecting an action is given by the proportion of that action being optimal. And in this case, the in our case, the simplified through this um, 
commutative distribution function of a standard normal distribution. And it was quite similar to this idea of Boltzmann exploration. So these different strategies that we have talked about, you can arrange them on a spectrum where um, on the one end, you have these very simple strategies such as pure exploitation. And these are simple strategies because you only have to consider the mean and look at the mean values of these different options and then simply pick the one that is highest. Boltzmann exploration is a bit more complex because it adds some form of noise. You have to do an additional transformation of these mean values by transforming them either to the sigmoid function or the softmax function. So it involves a bit more computations. Then you have these uh, two strategies here, upper confidence bound strategies and Thompson sampling, which are even more complex because they rely, rely on an additional variable to make decisions. In these two strategies, decisions are not only based on the mean, but also on the uncertainty of the agent. And then you have strategies that we did not talk about, uh, such as the Gittins index strategy, and more generally solutions to what is sometimes called a base adaptive Markov decision process. And these are kind of ways to implement an optimal solution for uh, multi-armed bandit problems. And they typically involve computations that are even much more complex than the ones that we have seen in an upper confident bound strategy or in Thompson sampling. The second part of this tutorial would have been about which of these strategies people are actually using. Um, I don't think we start with this now because we are pretty much running over time, but all the material is uh, available online, so you can check it out. Um, any questions left? Yeah. This one. Uh, could you repeat that? So is is that axis there like on the left is the uh, strategy that uh, favor exploitation and on the right strategy that favor exploitation? Uh, so here I would say this is an arrangement, a quite informal arrangement on how complex these strategies are. So exploitation is very simple because you only have to check the means. Whereas these upper confidence bound and Thompson uh, sampling based strategies are more complex because you also take uncertainty into consideration. What about the base? Yeah. So these are strategies that solve this kind of multi arm bandit problem optimally, and they also take uncertainty into consideration, but they additionally plan ahead in the future on how your uncertainties and uh, on how your beliefs might evolve in the future if you would see more data. So you additionally have this kind of planning process involved here and you have to solve this whole planning process um, to get a solution which is quite more much more complicated. Cool. Then if there are no more questions, ah, there's one more. Um, so I, yeah so i think it depends what you mean with reinforcement learning i think if you would talk to a neuroscience or to a psychologist they would say this is this is reinforcement learning um uh, if you would talk more to a machine learning person uh they would say oh yeah this is uh this is not really reinforcement learning because um, you don't have these uh, problems that involve a state such, such as Markov decision processes and so on. So these kind of bandit problems that I talked about are actually a subset of Markov decision processes where you don't have a state. Uh, so I think you could say these are reinforcement learning problems and some reinforcement learning algorithms rely on similar principles as we have discussed here. Cool. More questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can give that briefly because it is in the second part. So the high level summary in one slide is that people use a combination of both random and directed exploration. And they also rely on these strategies that make use of uncertainty estimates. So if you run the analysis and you can check how this works in the slides and in the code example, you would find out that most people apply strategies that look something like a combination of an upper confidence bound strategy and Thompson sampling. So they are somewhere on the spectrum here 
where they don't apply these optimal strategies, but they do something a bit smarter maybe than Boltzmann exploration or no exploration at all. Cool, then thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks again to Marcel. I think this was really valuable first. Um, yeah, uh, I just don't run out. I just make another announcement because of the uh, but, uh, for the online people. Uh, see you again tomorrow morning.